I'm Scott Allen Miller, it's the 12th of July, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I was talking to some people about currency and the US dollar and their worries about that and why they're looking at moving to Nicaragua when they are and to buy a home here because it allows them to convert that US currency into real property here in Nicaragua. I thought that actually is a really good topic for today. It's some things we should talk about because I think there's a lot of things that people should be aware of. So we're gonna get to that right after the bump. Before we dive too much into today's topic, I want to give a little bit of background. So on, on one side, a lot of people who watch my channel are interested not just in traveling or discovering Nicaragua, but have a very deep interest in potentially relocating uh, or, or retiring here. So they have a bit of a different uh, interest than you would have if you were, say, a digital nomad. So we're mostly going to be addressing concerns for people in that way today, but I think it's some good general, general information. My personal background, I actually come from a Forex background on Wall Street. I spent a decade there uh, working with the U.S. Fed uh, on the technical trading side of the U.S. dollar. So while I'm not a currency trader per se, my experience is one of the most senior that you will find in people in currency. So currency is well within my, my wheelhouse uh, and this is an area of which I'm actually an expert and I think there's a bit of things about currencies and I talk about them from time to time on the channel uh, that people do not understand and it's important to cover a lot of things about currencies because especially Americans when they're uh, looking to travel abroad are often being fed a lot of uh, a mixture of FUD and conspiracy theories and misinformation and if nothing else just marketing using things like dollar value uh, to push that and, and one of the reasons that that's really effective for Americans is one, America is a culture of fear. And so there's this commonality in things from the US that it's very easy to use fear of things, no matter how unrealistic or unfounded they are, to drive sales, to drive marketing. So people do that a lot and it's really effective uh, because people are taught that the world is a very scary place and legitimately the US is scarier than a lot of places, but, but not to the degree to which Americans are fearful of it, right? The Americans have just a lot of fear. There's some cultural uh, nurturing around that. And the second part is that the US dollar is actually pretty unique. It has been for the majority of our lifetimes, anyone who's watching this, the majority of our lifetimes, the US dollar has been the world standard currency. It's been the strongest currency in the world or the most influential, I should say. Uh, strength is a relative thing and it has always been relatively strong and stable. All those things make the dollar really special. It's also the uh, currency of oil trading. For example, a lot of things happen in the US dollar and only in the US dollar. Many other countries use the uh, US dollar directly, such as uh, Ecuador, El Salvador, and Panama. Uh, because of that, the US dollar is special. And so when there's concerns about the US dollar, they tend to be much larger. If you were to come from Mexico, for example, and be dealing with the peso, uh, the same things exist as risks, the same things exist as opportunities, the same fears and whatever, but the culture is not one of worrying about the strength of the peso and there isn't this sudden fear that the world is going to collapse and that the peso is going to disappear. Currencies are generally pretty steady things. They do vary over time and understanding that ebb and flow is very important, uh, but I think people who are used to other currencies are much more used to that and Americans tend to see their currency as being a flat standard and the world moves around it, and that is not the case. All currencies float, all currencies change, and the US currency, the US dollar, is no exception to that, but our perception of it often is. And so it's very easy as an American, especially when you're looking at moving abroad and dealing with other currencies potentially for the first time, to really be aware and worried about your currency doing things that uh, may be normal uh, or may be very scary uh, or really dramatic, and it's easy as an American to be in a situation where you think that's going to be a lot more dramatic than it is. So I want to cover some things uh, that we talked about today and put it into a context of those who are looking to move abroad. It could be Nicaragua, it could be any number of places uh, to help understand how currencies work and how they apply in this situation. So the first thing I want to address, and this came up in the conversation today, is a fear of the United States moving to a digital currency. So let's just get this out of the way. 
basically every country is on a digital currency. That has been that case for as long as we can remember. That's not a thing. Like you don't worry about going to digital currency because we are on digital currency and everything works just fine. It did in the 80s, it did in the 90s, it does today, whatever. Digital currency is just how things are. Now there still is paper currency out there, but it doesn't matter, right? Everything is done through banking and credit cards and whatever the cash that you carry around is the anomaly, not the standard. And it doesn't affect anything. People didn't even think about the switch to digital because it's not very important. And so we shouldn't be worried about that. People will throw those terms around. Anyone who's using that to talk to you about currency, other than it's a, you know, we went to digital currency long ago, Anyone who's using those terms is a salesman or someone trying to stir up emotions to trick you into not thinking logically about money. So your only reaction to hearing someone talk about digital currency should be to shut down and run away. This is not a person you wanna to talk to. You do not wanna accept their opinion. Whatever they're about to say, its purpose is to mislead you. And just a general rule for humans, when you're trying to keep yourself from being misled, never, ever, ever, ever say, but it, it doesn't hurt to listen. Absolutely it does. That The fact that people say that is a marketing trick that dishonest people have said to trick you into letting them trick you more. Right, well it doesn't hurt to listen, does it? Absolutely. Being lied to absolutely hurts me. At best it wastes my time. But there's always the chance, and that chance is very far from zero, that I'm going to fall for it. And it doesn't matter if I fall for it this time, if enough people are given a chance to lie to me, eventually I'm going to believe it. That is a almost guarantee that if you let yourself listen to liars, you will believe their lies eventually. Maybe not the first time, maybe not the 10th time, but you gotta get out of that pattern. Never let, and, and here's an easy way to, to check. Do you feel it doesn't hurt to listen? If you think that has some potential to be true, then you've had so many people convince you to listen to a lie so much that they've gotten you to think that listening to lies might be okay. That itself is a meta example of a dishonest marketing trick that works really effectively and one that people have used to their advantage heavily. So watch out for that. You don't want to listen. So digital currency, everything's a digital currency. Are there exceptions? Yes, there are exceptions. But by and large, there's no reasonable exception. Everything's a digital currency. Move past it. It is not a point of concern. We all tend to be concerned. It's kind of like, uh, so I work a lot in telephony. Uh, it's people are afraid of VIP phones. Oh, I, I don't want to move to these new VIP phones. That scares me. They can't say why they're scared of it normally, but they have this fear. You say, well, the first thing is they're not new. They've been around for decades. Um, and then, and, and often, the people I talk to, they've been around so long that they've never had to deal with phones except VOIP phones, right? So they're not like, well, I grew up on this and now it moved to this. No, they've only had this and they're still fearing it as some new thing. And it turns out that for as long as they can remember, they've been using that thing, they just weren't told because they were able to be switched without anyone being any the wiser and because they were being fearful of it, someone came up with a generally very expensive trickery-based mechanism to put them on the only thing that makes sense. There's absolutely, absolutely no technical reason why you should be on anything but a VOIP phone. And, and if you think there is, get in those comments, but you're gonna get quite a rebuttal because I've done this for 25 years and trust me, everything you've heard that gives any technical reason why VOIP is not the way to go is someone being incredibly dishonest to you who was trying to pull a fast one and hoped you'd never talk to someone who would outright uh, call their bluff because I will get on the phone with anyone who thinks that and I will point out the lies live and I am not opposed to calling people out live. I'm willing to call people liars to their face. I will do so uh, and do quite often, right? So uh, that, that's part of my job, right? Part of my job, I do a lot of different things. One of those is corporate naysayer, right? I'm a person who helps shoot down ideas and that, that sounds terrible, but it's really important for companies or, or people who are looking to invest. Oh, I have this idea, I'm gonna make ice cream in the desert, right? People are gonna love it. Okay, how are you gonna do that? Who are your customers? Where are you? I'm here to tell you there's reasons why people aren't doing that. It doesn't make sense, right? I don't know about that particular example, just throwing something out there. But you gotta have that voice of reason, right? So I and that voice of reason. Have you thought about all these things that could go wrong? Because if you don't, you're gonna do something crazy and then be like, why don't we have any customers? <gasps> we built this where there's no town. Oh, we forgot about customers. That's why you need a corporate naysayer. Similarly, with businesses, a lot of businesses bring me in because I tell them the hard truths that they don't wanna hear, that poor decisions were made in the, in the past, that the person they thought was their friend is a, is a 
slimy salesperson who's been lying to them and taking advantage of them and honestly in many cases doesn't think very much of them because they're willing to say really obvious lies uh, to try to trick them into being fearful and reacting to something and uh, a place where that happens a lot is insecurity if you have people who are coming to you and saying oh you're so insecure you've got to have all these security software you go buy antivirus you got to do all those people are the security breach right that you're being misled by people who are trying to sell you unneeded security they're the actual security problem and your reaction to them if you if you listen to them if you give them the time to to trick you if you fall for their lies that's where you're vulnerable not the things that they're trying to fix they themselves are the person trying to get through your security and by listening to them and taking their advice you're letting them through you're opening the drawbridge and saying ah invading army that that talks so nicely from the other side of the moat come on in and rape and pillage my village so that that kind of stuff so it's very important to have those people like me telling you people are trying to take advantage of you think critically don't just listen and don't don't give them the chance to keep repeating it. There's no way you won't fall for it if you let them repeat over and over again because it just builds up in your mind. It's a, it's a standard marketing trick that they teach you in psychology of how to mislead people. Okay, so that's the first piece. Digital currency is what we have. It's a great thing. It's the only thing you want, right? Just like VOIP, you never want to be stuck in a situation where you only have a paper currency. You don't have to worry about that because no one does that. But if it were to happen, that's the thing you should be fearful of. It means there aren't protections. It means it's very, very poorly maintained. It means they haven't updated with modern security, modern management, modern efficiencies. That aside, what a lot of people are doing is they use fears around cryptocurrency, which we're going to talk about in a second, and make people think that digital currency is somehow risky because of that. Prior to cryptocurrencies, no one was seriously worried about digital currency. It was the only thing that made sense. But now that cryptocurrency has had so many problems, it's easy to make people go back and think that digital currency will also have those problems, even though they know it doesn't because it's been around and it doesn't have those problems. And in fact, it is against digital currencies that cryptocurrencies show that they don't work very well. But again, it's not actually cryptocurrency. So let's talk about this. When people talk about cryptocurrency, you're not talking to currency professionals. I just, I'm just willing to go out on a limb here. You're not talking to currency professionals about cryptocurrency. When you hear about cryptocurrency, you're hearing it from the news, which is just people making money off of whatever they can say on TV that you'll watch. That is not a source for learning about things. Or you're learning about it from like a YouTube channel where someone is just making money by saying whatever you'll watch. Again, it's just a form of media. Uh, or it's someone who's trying to sell you something, whether it's getting you into currency or making you afraid of currency so they can sell you something else. Both work really well. But when you're dealing with cryptocurrencies, you're always dealing with these speculative ones like Bitcoin, things that make essentially no sense. If you're a speculator and that's what you want to do, like that's a career, like go do that, that's fine. But don't act like that's currency just like if someone was to come up with a wacky new playing card let's say magic the gathering and said oh this is where you should be investing your money and yes some people make money at it some people lose money at it remember anytime someone makes someone loses um so you're like oh i'm investing in paper no 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 you're investing in magic the gathering the fact that it's printed on paper is kind of coincidental that's not the thing you're banking on you're not investing in the paper you're investing in the trademark material of magic the gathering and it may be good it may be bad but it's irrelevant to the fact that it's paper if today magic the gathering does anyone even remember magic the gathering i don't know why i picked that as an example baseball trading cards doesn't matter whatever if any of these things move to pure plastic, oh, we're just going to do it on plastic, or glass, little pieces of glass, this, we'll imagine they don't shatter on you, it wouldn't fundamentally change that there is this speculative nature as to the value of the card, right? The substrate that it's printed on is all but irrelevant, but you would not refer to it as it being a paper pulp investor or anything of, this, of the sort. But when we're dealing with cryptocurrencies, that's what we're dealing with. People who are investing in Bitcoin or Dogecoin or whatever, they're just speculating on this particular currency's marketing efforts to get people to jump on board on something that none of them understand, which makes it far worse than Magic the Gathering or baseball cards, because those things are straightforward, and everyone who's buying them goes, it's a picture of a baseball player or a dragon, and some stats about it, or its hit points, and, or both of their hit points, I guess, if you look at it that way, and one way, and that's, that's the commonality of trading cards, hit points, and no matter what, it's do people want to collect this card or get this one to, to beat more things in their fight, whatever. That's the thing that's potentially making money. That's what you're speculating on. With Bitcoin and those things, you're speculating on how many people are going to be tricked by it this month, right? And that's really what it comes down to. It's a bunch of people 
playing a game of biggest fool and everybody throws their money in and gets out thinking it's about to collapse. And that is it, right? People don't do that with the US dollar. People don't do that with the Canadian dollar. People don't do that with the Euro because it makes no sense because normal people are using it to buy and sell and that regulates the market. If it became suddenly worth 10 times as much, we'd all go out and spend it all on things. We'd have all kinds of stuff. And when it collapsed, we'd then sell it and get lots more money. And then when it goes up again, we'd buy lots of stuff. We would regulate the market just like that. But no one's buying or selling anything on these cryptocurrencies. Not really. Not enough to regulate the market. So it's all the, you know, 99% of the movement of the cryptocurrencies you've heard of are just speculators moving the currency around and not using it as a currency. So at that point, it's not even a currency. Technically, it's a currency, but it's not acting as one in any way. That's not a cryptocurrency. It's simply a crypto blockchain speculation mechanism. It's a different thing. When people are talking about real use of cryptocurrency. It is simply a behind the scenes mechanism to protect normal currency. That's all. And there's no reason to be scared of it because it's simply a well-proven technology for security. Nothing else. And so again, if people are talking about the US moving to, so this is a big one, the US is gonna move to digital currency. Um, no, they already did long, long ago. Don't get caught up in that. Well, what if the US moves to a cryptocurrency? What if they do? How would that affect you? The bottom line is it wouldn't. Currency is currency. These things that people worry about is pure FUD. Absolutely. If they use cryptocurrency instead of serial numbers to prove the validity of dollars, the only thing that it helps is that you don't have to worry so much about getting counterfeit bills and you don't have to worry about so many counterfeiters putting fake money into the system. It helps fight inflation. What you should be worried about is inflation, and you should be driving the U.S. towards cryptocurrency to actually protect the people who have the money. But no countries are doing that today. You can't point to examples of cryptocurrency and say, well, it didn't work for them, because there is no one it didn't work for, right? There are cryptocurrencies that are speculative, and you can tell when people talk about uh, Ethereum and Dogecoin and, and Bitcoin and all those things. If you've heard of them, they are not real world cryptocurrencies for use by economies. So, and then people will use those things to either create excitement or fear, whatever it is that they're trying to sell you on. And we should immediately go, wait, 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 that's not at all relevant to what we're talking about, which is a, na a nation using cryptocurrency. Now you're gonna say, Scott, look, El Salvador went to Bitcoin and they use that as their national currency and that was a disaster. Yes, that is correct, sort of. They went to Bitcoin, one, it is not their currency. They simply used a speculation currency. What they did was they stopped using a regular currency and went to speculation instead. That is not the same as choosing to move a national currency to uh, crypto, to blockchain. So they did exactly what I'm warning people about. They let fear or excitement of marketing catch them off guard and they acted emotionally. I know they were trying to do a good thing. They've done a lot of good things in El Salvador. That just wasn't one of them. And they made a huge blunder with things they didn't understand that very few people do. And they did it in a way that would make the populace really excited because they don't understand what's going on and they all got tricked together. It had some potential, but very, very little. The country lost a fortune on it, but not because they were on a cryptocurrency, but because they speculated with the national treasury. That is a very different thing. We have to identify speculating with a national treasury is reckless and dangerous. Using a cryptocurrency is not at all. If you say, but you don't understand what cryptocurrencies are. There is no, but, to that statement, uh, I guess you could come in and say, but we think the blockchain concept is gonna be broken and there's some huge technical thing that makes it, okay, I don't believe that's true. I think that's FUD you're hearing from some conspiracy theory, but if, if that was to be true, okay, that would make uh, cryptocurrencies a problem. But that is not what we're talking about. It is people who are using examples. It's just like I hired a drunk monkey to drive my car and it drove it into a tree. And then coming back and saying, I'm scared of cars because they go into trees. Yes, any car can be driven by a drunk monkey. Any car can have an accident, but we also know that normally cars go down the road and don't crash into things most of the time. So that reaction should be, oh, drunk monkey shouldn't drive, not cars can't be steered. Right, but when it comes to things like cryptocurrency, we, we ignore the drunk monkey and just focus on it must be the car's fault. Right, and that, that should not be the reaction. If it is, it means we're not 
thinking about the things. We're just reacting emotionally. And no matter what you're doing, this is a huge life lesson, if you're reacting emotionally instead of critically thinking, you are putting yourself at amazing risk. You are handing the control of your mind to other people. Once you do that, you, whether you, if you're just doing it in your own head, you're, you're just in a position to be taken advantage of. If you let people know that that emotional reaction is happening, they've been informed that you can be manipulated. You're already in the process of being manipulated. They just have to steer you, right? You've already given up critical thinking. So your course correction, your taking the reins and making sure you don't do something crazy has been given up and you are no longer in control. You can be guided however people want to guide you. So you want to be really careful about those things. It's an incredibly dangerous position to be in, in general, just in life decision making. And we all do it all the time. But when it comes to things like currencies and your life savings and relocating and uh, investing and buying a house is an incredibly dangerous thing to start doing it based on emotions because those emotions are essentially guaranteed not to be tied in any meaningful way to reality. And investing depends on reality to keep you from making huge blunders. Otherwise, people would do things like invest in bonds instead of stocks, even though all logic and all proof and all experience says that doesn't make any sense as the most reckless thing you can do short of setting your money on fire. Why would you do that? But emotionally, it feels good. Just like driving a car feels safe and flying feels dangerous, but we know statistically that is so completely untrue, right? It's not like a little bit safer in a plane. It is so much safer in an airplane. So those things are important. When you let emotions take over, things like your, your life safety, your uh, uh, investing dollars, that's how you end up in really dangerous situations. So we got to stop doing that. We got to think critically. If we don't understand how something works, don't become emotionally t attached to it. Right? It's fine not to understand cryptocurrency. You don't need to. There's no major government considering using cryptocurrency. And even El Salvador, it was an experiment. They only did it with part of the money and they're not really, like it's, it's not really a thing. No one else is talking about it. This is purely an American marketing thing. That's another thing that's important. The world is not sitting around talking about cryptocurrencies. Only American salespeople. There is still this thing where American salespeople are out there trying to convince people about cryptocurrencies. The rest of the world has pretty much forgotten that they exist. When you mention it, we're always like, what a weird American thing to be harping on about cryptocurrencies. Who, who's even thinking about that? Yeah, Americans are obsessed with it. We all forget. Like, honestly, I can go six months at a time without someone mentioning it. And then someone will mention on the channel, well, isn't everyone down there going to cryptocurrency? And you're like, what now? What? Yes, I know. El Salvador, a couple of years ago, tried something. If, if anyone had been considering it, and trust me, no one was, that they went to it and it was such an unmitigated disaster, they showed that you can't casually go to it. You have to have your own currency. You have to have a central bank. You can't give up all the mechanisms that make currencies work just because you have blockchain to make it a little bit more secure. They thought they could just skip all the hard steps and go right to it because they, what they did before is just use the US dollars. US dollars. So they already skipped the central bank. They didn't have the mechanisms necessary to consider going to crypto. And they were dependent on the US. They wanted to get away from that dependency, but instead of putting in the pieces they were missing, they just did something random. And that was why it was dangerous. But nobody else was considering something like that because it was obviously crazy, obviously going to do exactly what it did. Anyone with any knowledge of crypto could have predicted that without any effort whatsoever. It is the absolute obvious thing. No other country is talking about such a wild, crazy thing. It's just not a thing. So don't worry about it. Don't think that it is. It's just an American thing to, to rile people up and make sales. Another major concern that may be something that you're thinking about is the fear of a catastrophic collapse of the U.S. currency in a more general sense. Mostly this would mean hyperinflation. Now, this is a much more realistic fear. It is still not something we should expect. We should not be particularly worried about it any more than we are in any other economic times. But it is at least a real thing that you should be aware of as a risk and know that protecting against inflation, whether it's slightly increased inflation, uh, just normal inflation or hyperinflation is something we should always be considering. So that's not necessarily a bad thing to be talking about. However, again, in the United States, there is a tendency to use extreme levels of fear and a tendency a, and, and a very culturally uh, uh, supported um, environment where it's considered normal and even appropriate to act uh, emotionally to um, hysterical levels of fear that, that, that don't really make very much sense. And so again, acting logically given this potential risk is very important. So the first thing is we have no reason to expect hyperinflation. Yes, the world is seeing heightened inflation right now. That is true. 
So there's two factors. One, there's inflation, and then there's inflation versus the rest of the world, right? The world is seeing inflation across the board right now. And that means that relative inflation is roughly zero. So, uh, and that's always the case, but the United States is actually doing fairly well. The rate of inflation in the United States is not particularly high compared to the rest of the world. Some places like Europe, it's particularly high. And so the U.S. is actually experiencing a very, a very mild amount of inflation going on from a uh, relative sense, even though it's a little bit high in an absolute sense, much higher than we've had in recent years. But we're actually seeing more of a uh, reaction to people seeing several years of very low inflation and then seeing a moderately high inflation uh, may, it seems much worse than it actually is because they've, they've not been used to standard inflation for quite some time. So it's a perception thing in many cases. If you look at the historic uh, performance of the U.S. dollar as an index against the world currencies, the United States dollar is still actually a little bit strong. If you're not familiar with the concepts of strong and weak currencies, go check my video on that. Uh, but it is only slightly strong. It's not super strong. And it is a little bit higher than normal. And it is it looks to be in a process of simply doing normal course correction back to its normal steady state. This is completely expected. There is nothing in the charts currently that shows a trend that should be alarming or worrisome or even cause for comment. That's very important when you have someone who says, oh, there's this runaway inflation. Oh, the dollar is not worth anything. Oh, we're doing all these terrible things. OK, show me. Show me a chart that shows that compared to world currencies and not a single cherry picked currency, but actual indexes, right? We could say, well, look compared to the British pound and oh, look how it's performing. Well, what you're actually probably looking at is the performance of the pound rather than the dollar. The dollar is a much larger, much more steady currency than say the pound. Uh, and so the pound is much more likely to be reactionary. It's much more likely to fluctuate compared to the dollar. The dollar, due to the size of the economy, due to the fact that multiple countries use it as its primary currency, it has a lot of uh, dampening effects that other currencies do not. So if you're coming from a small economy with a floating currency, uh, Argentina, for example, you're likely to see spikes and troughs uh, happen all the time. The currency is able to float and is kind of encouraged to do so. It's how the market corrects for itself under normal circumstances. In the United States, we have the opposite effect. The market is so large that it can't really do that. Uh, and because it's used in so many places, when the economy is doing one thing in one place, it's doing another and another, and they have to share that effect across them. And so the negatives is that, is that the U.S. economy lacks this rapid changing dollar value dampening against the rest of the economy, but it benefits from having a dampening effect on the dollar itself. And so you have a fairly predictable value to the dollar over time. That was a very complicated way of saying that hyperinflation is a risk and you should keep it in mind, but you should also, you should never keep it in mind unless you are also keeping in mind the fact that there is nothing statistically, nothing in the charts, nothing going on that suggests or point to, points to a risk any more than any other time that hyperinflation may be coming. There's not a particular fear of that. So again, it's just one of those things that it's easy to say. It's hard for people to prove that it's not the case. People don't understand currencies or inflation. And so it's very easy to use that as a tool to create fear and encourage people to do things that are kind of reckless. Now, that being said, inflation is a real thing and inflation is a little bit higher now than at other times. So, so we're going to look into how that affects us in the real life and how real estate may be a buffer against that. Now, before we get on to talking, talking about houses, one of the things that you may be thinking is that by moving your US currency into a place or into a different currency, that it, that may protect you against inflation in the United States. And absolutely, that's worth considering. Like, that's a very real thing. But we have to be careful with that. So, for example, if we're talking about Costa Rica or Guatemala with their quetzals, what is going to happen is that you're going to take your US currency and you're going to shift it into that lo local currency if you want to do this thing to protect against U.S. inflation. The problem is, is that remember, we just said that the U.S. has some of the lowest inflation. It has some of the best buffers against inflation, the dampening effects. And these small countries, especially ones like Costa Rica or Guatemala, Honduras, uh, um, uh, or, or even uh, Mexico or Belize, they have very small economies. Mexico is a little bit different. They have a giant economy, but still one that's very dynamic. Uh, but in all these cases, their currencies are much more likely to go up or down dramatically and very quickly compared to the United States. If you are worried about inflation in the United States, you should look at these countries. Not that they are more or less likely to have inflation per se, but their chances of having a high or very low rate of inflation versus the United States 
is very likely. So there's a possibility of having wildly fluctuating currency, whereas in the US it tends to fluctuate very slowly. So that emotional effect, that panic response of, oh no, it's doing something I don't like, will be magnified most likely in that you will have a currency where it actually moves day to day and you're like, ah, it's doing things I'm scared about. Whereas in the US, you really are pretty sheltered from that. And if it feels like it's moving uh, very dramatically, you're probably sensing something else. But in those countries, you may actually be sensing the currency moving. But all that being said, if you wanted to move to Guatemala, as an example, or move to Mexico, move everything into the peso or into the quetzal, uh, that's something you can do. Right, those countries will be happy to have your money shift into the country, and you'll take your chances versus the US dollar. Basically, you're betting that the US dollar is at a high point when you move, and that it'll only be lower for the foreseeable lifetime that you're looking at. That's a pretty big gamble. It's a real one that you may want to take, but it's not one I would adv advise against doing lightly. Currencies don't tend to change that quickly. If they do, it's not the US currency that tends to adjust quickly, it is others. So if someone's going to hyperinflate or hyperdeflate, you're probably going to want to watch that happen from the position of the United States, not from the position of the in currency that is changing rapidly. It is a dangerous place to be. So that doesn't tend to be something you want to do. The US dollar, no matter how much you feel worried about the US dollar today, it is still one of the world's, if not the world's safest currency. Maybe the euro is safer, but easily not. It is very important to remember the dollar, just because it is not as incredibly stable as it has been in the past, doesn't make it unstable. We're using a position of very slow change, very predictable change, very powerful world use dollar, and moving to slightly less. But if you ask people in other countries, they'd be like, you see not being as far in front at like, why would you go from the world leader currency to maybe second place and your response be to panic and jump to 112th place and go to a wild ride of crazy currency world? That's not a very wise reaction. You generally want to keep it in the dollar. People from all those countries are like, how can we move our money into dollars so that we can ride out the waves a little bit more easily? Maybe it goes up, maybe it goes down, but at least it's predictable. The other thing that's worth noting, in some countries such as Panama, Ecuador, and El Salvador, they actually use the US dollar. So in those markets, you can't do that. Just by moving to those markets, you're going to still ride with the dollar the same as you did back in the United States. You'd actually get more of a break by moving to Canada. If you want to come to Nicaragua, and of course, if you're watching this channel, there's a very good chance of that. Um, it is very important to note that our Cordoba, while it is not locked to the dollar, is soft lock to the dollar. It moves with the dollar automatically. So if the dollar is getting strong, the Cordoba is getting strong. If the dollar gets weak, the Cordoba gets weak. That soft lock means that there is some amount of float. It will float from time to time, but by all, for all intents and purposes, it is just a reflection of the dollar. Every Cordoba represents something like 2.95 cents, right? And it's just, it's just a type of dollar, right? If the United States offered a three and a half cent coin and then named everything for that, that's basically how the Cordoba works. So the idea that you would move your money into Cordoba and be like, oh, I'm no longer subject to the whims of the, of the US dollar, that's not a good way to think of it. You would almost certainly be subject to any inflation or deflation that came with the US dollar. So just, just be aware that this economy, being as small as it is, uh, and, and just by the very nature of things, is tied to the dollar because the dollar dominates the local currencies. It's also worth noting that if the dollar hyperinflates, almost all the currencies around here, even if they're not locked to it in any way whatsoever, they tend to inflate with it simply because of the nature of being within the same market. All of that brings us to housing. How do houses and real estate help you buffer against the worry, the concern of changes in currency values? Well, they do quite a bit, actually. Uh, if currencies have a relatively solid steady state that moves relatively slowly, simply by the nature of inflation, inflation is always happening and it's just a thing, right? So you have to kind of account for it. Houses and real estate basically have a very strong steady state that effectively never changes. A house has a certain value as a ratio of income levels in the local market, local normally being a national market or near national market. And while you can have areas in like the United States right now, there are a few areas where houses are below what their steady state should be. And in most areas, they are above or wildly above and making it very difficult to buy a house because the cost is very high. 
in uh, those situations, it's easy to say, no, no, you can see houses gain this value. That is never true. A house cannot gain value. It cannot lose value. Well, it can, but it can, but it's through like the walls fell down. I got roof damage, right? That thing lowers the value. Um, you know, someone put in a new water tower that raises the value. Like those things change it. But, uh, but a house, a property, they have roughly an even value that is predictable over the centuries. And this is, you can look over the centuries and see this to be true. And in every year, there are people who say, well, it's not true now. Of course, they always said that. Of course, there's marketing and salespeople and tricksters and hucksters and, and con men who want to make you believe that all math, all science, all reason, all logic aren't applicable and that for some reason you or that house or this particular moment in time is an exception to all economic or physical rules. But logically, it can't be the case. Logically, a house has to be a function of people's income. If it isn't, then where does its value come from? If a house costs too much, people won't live in it. People can keep living at home if, if a house becomes too costly. If houses become too cheap, people who would otherwise live at home start buying houses. If they get too cheap, then people who traditionally have one house start having two houses. Things mitigate the market, and as people pay more than those people, divest themselves of their extra homes because people have to live somewhere and have no particular use for extra houses, there is this really, really strong market dampening effect over time. And if you realize that, if you understand that, it shows why I say houses cannot be an investment. They can be a speculation, but they are not an investment because an investment implies that you're putting your money into something that is going to grow over time. Houses do not grow. They get speculative. People want them at a given moment, don't want them at another moment, and you're simply riding the wave. It's much like being a day trader on Wall Street rather than being an investor. They are different things. They have a relationship, but they are different things. And that's where houses come in. And when you're looking looking at a house for yourself, right? There's, there's people who are using the housing market as an investment mechanism or as a trading mechanism, as a speculation mechanism. That's one thing. I'm just buying a house. Maybe I'll rent it out. If I get a good offer, I'll sell it, right? But if it's my house, it's the one I'm going to live in. It's the one my family's going to be in. It's the one I'm going to be emotionally tied to. It's the one I'm going to look at every day, the one that affects my daily life. That's different generally for most of us. And it's important that we, that we think of it in a good financial way, but also not think of it as an investment per se, but think of it as simply part of the mechanism of our lives. And in doing so, we have an opportunity when we choose a house to potentially move currency, whether it's US dollars or Cordoba or euros or whatever, into something physical. And it's for most of us, right? If you're super rich, then you get this opportunity daily, right? But for most of us, this, there's this once in a lifetime event to move a large quantity of our, our currency savings, of our otherwise liquid savings into real estate, house, property, farm, whatever. And then we may buy different ones over time and, and shift that money from one location to another, but essentially we most of us own one. And that one thing represents our single largest buffer against inflation. And the nice thing about real estate, because it has that steady state, it automatically rides with inflation, just like jobs do. Right, so you have this like guarantee that uh, your house is going to exist as a place for you to live and that its value, at least over the long haul, is going to hold because it always does. There's no such thing as property that's become worthless with obvious exceptions. Well, there's Love Canal. People dumped a bunch of nuclear waste in a spot. Now the houses are worthless. Yeah, someone can destroy your house. But the actual value of real estate, apart from people actually contaminating the land, setting your house on fire, things like that, doesn't actually change it never changes dramatically, right? Even in the US in this hyper uh, market for, for housing, it's not changing that dramatically and uh, almost never in a falling way. When there's speculation, it's normally up and only so far down. So it tends to go down for long periods of time and go up and crash again quite quickly. Hence why we call it bubbles. So there is a real opportunity. There is a real value to moving money from a currency into real estate. And the United States has currently a slightly strong currency. It's above its traditional average, its median. And Nicaragua is quite dramatically low on its housing market, below its all-time median. So when you put those two things together, there actually is an opportunity via speculation, not via investing, where the US dollar is up, Nicaraguan real estate is down, and if you do a transfer now, and this has been true for many years, so this is not a momentary thing, if you do a transfer now, you're getting, you're leveraging more real estate for your dollar than you would normally. The expectation is that over time, the US dollar will on average, only average, it will have times where it's higher and times where it's lower. On average, it will decrease in its value, but only a little bit. And that the real estate in Nicaragua will increase over time, probably dramatically two or three times. 
So that combination means you're able to get more for your dollar today, get it into real estate, and over time, that is going to protect you more and more as the expectation is that the Nicaraguan real estate, whether it's in two years or 10 years or 15 years, is going to start coming back up to its steady state. It's below its steady state right now. As it climbs, your holdings, your investments, your life savings become more and more protected as the value of that and the ease of selling it and liquidating it becomes better and better. So what is the summary of this? The summary of this is pretty simple. It's very important to act using math when it comes to uh, investments and life savings and things of that nature. We should not be looking at Nicaragua simply because we're afraid that the US market, economy, currency, or whatever is going to go haywire and lose its mind and completely destroy the country. That's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how many experts they put onto the media to get you all psyched up and scare you it's not going to happen. Could the US economy decline? Absolutely. Would that decline lead to a, a softening of the dollar? No, not very likely. That's not how things work. People say that all the time because it's a simple thing to make people think that those things are tied together, but they're not. The chances that both would happen is, relative, is already low for either to happen. For both of them to happen is quite unlikely. Even if both things happened, it's not the end of the world. If you have savings, it's, you'd need dramatic amounts of both to really make things rough for you. The idea, and if we are in a situation where the US went through that kind of collapse, it's going to potentially take out every country in the region with it as the entire region starts to collapse because they are intertwined economies. So it's important to remember that the things we often do to mitigate disaster can actually exacerbate disaster. And so uh, while that doesn't mean you shouldn't look abroad, you shouldn't do other things, you shouldn't do so thinking that it's gonna insulate you from individual market mechanics. The thing that insulates you from individual market mechanics is that most of us are not that dependent on the market. Yes, some uber rich people are going to lose a bunch of money, but are we? Is it really gonna affect us? Actually, would maybe the econ economic collapse of the United States would be good for us as normal Americans, right? You have to consider that just because the news makes it sound scary, they're just trying to get your eyeballs, right? It's not that it's actually that bad of a thing. I'm not saying that we want the US economy to decline, I'm saying that we may not be taking the hit on that the way that people imagine. So where's your real exposure? What's your real fear? What's your real risk? So I think all those things, yes, it's good to be knowledgeable, but don't, don't study those things unless you're prepared to think logically about it. As long as you're going to react emotionally to something, as long as you're gonna allow people who have no idea what they're talking about or who do and don't care that they're lying to you to tell you things, don't study them, walk away. It's better to be like, I don't even understand these words than to kind of understand and be in a position where people can make you fearful of something that's completely false or nearly false. Uh, so that part, don't react emotionally to that. Don't worry about those things. That is, could things go bad? Yes. Can you logically protect yourself against them by knowing they're gonna, no, right? That's one of the most important things. No matter how much you know the economy is going to collapse or the dollar is gonna collapse or it's gonna get whatever, the things that we often do to protect against it may, make no sense. And so knowing it didn't do us any good. It's like knowing your car is gonna crash and not knowing you should put your foot on the brakes and just climbing into the back seat and hoping for the best. Right, okay, great, you knew there was gonna be a crash and instead of tightening your seatbelt and hitting the brakes, you just climbed into the back seat and prayed? Well, of course you had a, still had a crash and of course it still ended up bad. You could have predicted that not knowing what to do made all your other preparations pointless. But does that mean you shouldn't be looking at real estate here in Nicaragua? No, you should definitely be looking at real estate here in Nicaragua, but not for those reasons. Right, you should be looking at it for the reasons of the dollar is strong, the economy in the north is currently good, the economy down here is weak, there is a huge decrease in the real estate market right now. Yes, it's been going on for a few years. No, it's not gonna turn around in the next two years. So yes, you have some time, but it is time to get things in motion, start putting money aside, start thinking about it, get down here, start making plans, but let's back up a second. We just established it's good. You gotta get down here, get a house, buy property, start moving your money into real estate here because that's how you're gonna protect your, your money. Sure, we just did that, but don't let it get emotional for you. Only let it get emotional enough that you're like, okay, I'm really gonna look into this. I'm really gonna consider it. I'm really gonna take my time and, and engage my brain and cr think critically and not let salespeople, whether it's some con artist or it's just Scott being excited about the market and wants to see good things happen and, and is doing this himself and thinks you should too, right? Hold on and say, okay, Scott's very infectious and he probably has some good ideas and he's filling me with some good, good, good stuff, but, but, but it's really easy to get excited 
And even if Scott's not trying to get me to run down and buy the first thing, it's what happens to almost everyone I talk to is they hear me say, things are great, I love it, you should, you should really consider real estate here. And when I then say, here's how you should approach it to be safe, they go, well, I don't wanna do that part. I wanna to listen to Scott for this exciting part, and I wanna ignore him for this important protect myself part. Consistently, that's what happens. Okay, so what do you do once you start getting that excitement? Don't, don't give up the excitement, but, but temper it. You can't just buy a house remotely. Watch my video on buying houses remotely, don't do that. Come down, I always say this, get on a plane. If you're, the one reaction you should have is, we gotta get there right away, yes. You should get here right away and start looking around. You should start getting a feel for, is this something you really want? Let's assume you've been here, you know it's something you really want, but you weren't sure about buying a house. You still shouldn't just hop down and buy a house. You should get here, start looking around, determine where you wanna be, determine where you want to live, and almost certainly go rent something, someplace so you can get down here and stay down here and start experiencing the long-term lifestyle. Right, which is different than the tourism lifestyles, different than the visiting lifestyle. I think it's better, personally. But it's something you need to experience, because maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll love it, maybe it's just not quite what you were looking for. Make those decisions early while you start doing really serious research looking for a house. You can do that on your own. You can contract someone like me who would love to give you tours, take you around, and help you see lots of places. All of that's fine, but make sure you're not getting ahead of yourself, don't put the cart in front of the horse, take enough time to make a good logical decision because unless you're super rich, in which case you have advisors for this stuff and you shouldn't be doing it yourself probably, then you need to be very carefully planning where your life savings is gonna be going, where you're gonna be stuck living, where you're gonna be based, how that's going to affect your life and not only make good choices about your location, your community and those things, but also good choices about the actual house, the property, how it holds up in the rain, how it handles the sunny season, how traffic is in front of your house. Is it noisy at night? There's so many things you need to consider. And a lot of those aren't gonna even occur to you if you've never been living here. When we lived here for our first year in the city, suddenly, and this, the fact that there are fireworks going off in the distance highlights this perfectly. We lived by a church, which seemed like one of the best things ever. It's so safe. It's it's well lit, there's always stuff going on. One of those things that's always going on is fireworks. Our dogs were terrified all the time and I had a hard time making videos because I could never talk over the fireworks. Literally, they went off all throughout the day, every day. And church bells that you couldn't talk over. It made making phone calls and doing my work, everything I do was difficult. Now we know we have no interest of living near a church. It's just not something we can do. But we would never have guessed that until we lived here and were in a place and gave it a try and said, oh, we love this city. We love this. We love that. We love this is not an option. Cannot do it. Right. Until you walk your dogs in the city versus walking them in the country. You can walk them in the city. I did it for a year, but I prefer it in the country. My life is much better now. Right. Little things that you may have a hard time predicting or you say, ah, oh, that's not going to be a big deal, but maybe it is. Right? Give yourself some of that time, rent, make sure you're making a good decision. Even if you pay one, 2% more for a home in the long run, because of that weight, the amount of protection that it gives you is so significant. Consider even taking a risk. Now, if it was gonna be 50%, I'd be like, just buy a house, right? Figure it out later, adjust as necessary, right? Make the best decision you can, but don't wait. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that things do not change that fast. There is lots of stuff on the market. There are many, many options. And the most important thing is getting here and giving yourself time to make good decisions so that when you do pull the trigger, it is on target, the right thing for you, the thing that's gonna make you happy, the thing that's gonna pro uh, protect your nest egg, the thing that's gonna let you retire, the thing that's gonna give you the option to sell it in the future because it's a good place at a good price and to know what those prices should be and to know what else you could get for the same money. Because even if you said, well, that's worth 200,000 to me, great, but this other place is also 200,000 and you say, I never considered a place like that. That's fantastic. Oh, if I had known I could have gotten that for 200,000, I assumed that was 400,000. I couldn't do that. Then suddenly you're, well, I'm okay with 200,000. Doesn't make any sense because you're not getting what you could have gotten. So even when you can afford to make big financial mistakes, doesn't mean you want to because you're still going to lose not just the money, but potentially the opportunity. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel and bring content like this, which is very valuable, I hope to a great number of you, Check out the link just above buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. You can donate one coffee, three coffees, five coffees, 10 coffees if you like. It makes a huge difference, makes this channel possible. And if you're looking for direct one-on-one -on -one services to help you in relocation, finding a house, doing tours, whatever it is you need, hit us up on email info at relocatenicaragua.com. Share with your friends, post on social media, and I will see all of you tomorrow.